Greetings, all. I want you all to remember how to do something today. Reach in front of you and pick up your hymnal and open it to the pages where we will be singing. The monitor died this morning. We're trying to resuscitate it, but it's 15 years old, and the shelf life on a computer is three. So, you have to go back to the old school way of doing things, and that is bulletin and hymnal. I think that we can do it. I hope so too. We will be patient with you today. Thank you for being with us today for worship. However you are joining us, please let us know you are here either by signing the black pads in the pews or letting us know that you are worshiping with us on Facebook Live. Leading in the service today, we will have our song leader, worship leader, Joe. We will have our acolyte, James. We have Bev on piano, Pam on drums, the choir, and upstairs our trio of Chris, George, and Don. I couldn't come up with anything the Three Stooges, how's that? We'll do the Three Stooges today. Um, Pastor Trish is home with an upset tummy this morning, so you're just going to have to put up with Joe and me. So um, please, let us prepare for worship as we listen to the music that Beth has prepared for us. Just a reminder, our first hymn will be on page 363. I know it takes you a while to find it when it's not up on the monitors. When we become professing members of a United Methodist congregation, we profess our faith in God, our desire to live as disciples of Jesus Christ, and our commitment to join with our church community to keep the, the vows of our baptismal covenant. That's why through this past series, we've had the shell as a reminder of our baptism. Each time we bring in new members, it is an opportunity to renew our membership vows as well. 
These vows are to participate fully in the life and ministries of our local church through our prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. And even if we are not members of the church, understanding these vows is a good way to deepen our life of discipleship and witness. Today we focus on what it means to witness. This one is difficult. We so often think of witnessing as sharing some form of the four spiritual laws with individuals. But as United Methodists, identifying the needs in a community and taking action is what witness is all about, said the Reverend Mark W. Stamm, author of Our Membership Vows, a Discipleship Ministries resource. You discern as a congregation that this is the particular way that God is asking us to be faithful to our baptismal vows in this place. United Methodists can also witness individually to co-workers, friends, and neighbors. If we can be relieved of thinking we have to somehow become particularly articulate theologically to witness, if we can get past that, we are not asking people to be amateur preachers and teachers. We are asking them to live consistently with the gospel. Both John and Charles Wesley used their gifts to witness to the world. John left behind hundreds of sermons and journal entries that were his way of witnessing through time. Charles gave witness through his poetry in the words of his hymns. And Can It Be That I Should Gain is perhaps one of the most joyfully poignant hymns penned by Charles Wesley. On Whit Sunday, otherwise called Pentecost, May 21st, 1738, three days before his brother John experienced his heart strangely warmed at Aldersgate, Charles was convalescing in the home of John Bray, a poor mechanic, when he heard a voice saying, In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, arise and believe, and thou shalt be healed of all thy infirmities. The voice was most likely Mr. Bray's sister, who felt commanded to say these words in a dream. Anglican hymn writer Timothy Dudley Smith notes that the following then happened. Charles got out of bed and, opening his Bible, read from the Psalms, He have put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God, followed by the first verse of Isaiah 40, Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. He wrote in his journal, I have found myself at peace with God and rejoiced in the hope of love Christ. The statement from Mr. Bray's sister, I wish we knew her name, why does he get all the credit? Anyway, the statement from Mr. Bray's sister sparked within Charles a conviction like he had never felt before. Moved and convicted in spirit, Charles wrestled with these words, until he came to rest in his faith, knowing that it is by faith we are saved. Soon after this conversion experience, he wrote two hymns in celebration of the amazing love he had come to know. And can it be that I should gain? And where shall my wandering soul begin? Both hymns witness to the power and love of Jesus. Please stand in body or spirit as we sing all five verses of And Can It Be, number 363.
If you'd remain standing in body or spirit for our call to worship, which we will read responsively. The time for harvest is close at hand. What have you done with the gifts God has given you? Praise God for the gifts and for opportunities for service that they represent. We praise God for all the ways in which our God has been blessed. Generous God, accept our gifts and our lives this day. Loving God, accept our praise and gratitude. May we be clear Our hymn of praise this morning can be found in your hymnals on page 240, Hark the Herald, number 240. Turn, greet one another with the peace of Christ, then be seated as the, anyone who wishes to come up for the messy moment comes up. Peace of Christ be with you. during Lent when we don't say hallelujah. And we're nowhere close to Lent. We are in the season following Pentecost. But do you know what we're getting closer to? Well, which normally comes first. We're getting closer to Christmas, but we are also getting closer to Thanksgiving. Yes, let me finish, okay? We are also getting closer to the end of the church year, which happens this year 
on the last Sunday of November. It doesn't happen on December 31st. It happens on the Sunday before Advent begins. And Advent begins four Sundays before Christmas Eve. So it's going to be a mess this year because Christmas Eve is the fourth Sunday of Advent. It's very strange. It doesn't happen very often. But do you know what else is going to happen the very last Sunday of November? Mm, I bet you don't. Mr. Joe, do you know what I'm going to make for you on the very last Sunday of November when we decorate the trees? It's soup. And do you know what kind of soup it's going to be, Mr. Joe? It's tomato soup with coconut milk. <laughs> so you can eat it without throwing up. So just mark on your calendars the last Sunday of November when you're all tired of leftovers. Come and this church staff will make soup for you and we can decorate and we can celebrate the coming of a new church year. This entire last five weeks, every hymn that we have sung was written by the same man, it was written by Charles Wesley. Now, Charles Wesley lived in the 18th century, and he was John Wesley's brother. But he was a gifted writer and poet, and he took the gifts that he had, and he used them to tell the story of Jesus. Today we're talking about what it means to witness. And when you witness, you're telling something that you have seen or something that you know or something that you believe and, or that you heard, but it's really more about you when it's this kind of witnessing. And it tells the world what's important to you. And as a church, we're called to tell the world what is important to us. And that is that Jesus is the light of the world, that we will honor him, that we love him, and that he calls us to go out and do good things in the world to make a difference. So I want you to think about, don't answer this question yet, okay? We want everyone to think, what has God gifted you with that you can use to share the good news of Jesus with the world? I'm going to put a few people on, on the spot. Ms. Beth, what has God gifted you with? Your music. I think, too, your passion for a greener world, for making a difference in the way we use our earth. And, and her hospitality. Mr. Joe, can we embarrass you next? What, do you, what, what is Joe? What are Joe's gifts? Drinking coffee, yes. Joe reminds us how important it is to stay awake. God bless me with Gideon and Candlelight Sticks Cup of Dark Roast Coffee every school day. For about the next four or five years. Yes. So, but teaching is a gift. Not only teaching our youth here in the church, but even maybe more is showing the youth in the port what it means to be a good person who loves God. Whether you get to tell them that or not, they can see it in the way you live. James, you have so many gifts that I'm not going to ask you to tell me what they are. I'm going to tell you what I see. Your enthusiasm, your joy, your brilliant mind, he's going to fix us all before life is over. And the delight that you have in beckoning people to come to worship when you ring the bell, 
and when you carry the light in. Hmm, what am I going to do with my neighbor down there, Ruth? You have an infectious spirit. Do you know what that means? It means that when you are around, we know you are here in a very good way. You're helpful. You are polite. Of course, I have a feeling your mother might shoot you if you weren't polite. <laughs> Nonviolently, of course. You, um, you see things. And every so often, you come and you kidnap my dog and you take her for a walk so I don't have to. I've always thought that that's what we've had a particular way of making people feel really important when you're talking to them. Yes. Like when you're talking to him, then it's very clear. Absolutely, that's what we want to try to bring. To make the person feel really good. Yes. You have a way of making a person feel important. You do. Now, I could take the rest of the worship service and tell everyone else, but I think probably what I want you to do this week is to really think about the gifts that you have and how you can use them to witness the love of Jesus in your life. Let's pray. Dear God, God. thank you for giving each of us special ways ways. to share your love love. so that everyone everyone may know about it. it. Amen. Amen. Okay, you can go back to Sunday school. Joe and I are about to share with you what is called the Apocalypse in the book of Matthew. You've heard it before. It's that um, time when we are compared to sheep and to lambs and told that we didn't treat Jesus very well because we didn't treat others very well. Before we read this, Apocalypse means a pulling back of the curtain, or a pulling away of the veil, so that you may see things more clearly. Think about what happens when you're in your living room, or your den, or wherever you hang out in your house, and you hear a noise outside. You have to pull that curtain away in order to see what's going on. And even in this day of ring and outside monitors, you have to go and look to see more clearly what is there. This last, these are the last words of Jesus before he headed to the cross, or at least the last ones that that we know of, that we have, his last sermon. Um, Yeah, we have all the events on Monday, Thursday, but this, It's kind of like his last sermon. So pull away the veil a little bit and hear these words from Matthew 25, 31 to 45, in a new way. When the Son of Man comes in all his majesty, accompanied by throngs of heavenly messengers, his throne will be wondrous. All the nations will assemble before him, and he will judge them. distinguishing them from one another as a shepherd isolates the sheep from the goats. He will put some, the sheep, at his right hand and some, the goats, at his left. Then the king will say to those to his right, Come here, you beloved, you people whom my father has blessed. Claim your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you from the beginning of creation. You shall be richly rewarded, For when I was hungry, you fed me. And when I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was alone as a stranger, and you welcomed me into your homes and into your lives. I was naked, and you gave me clothes to wear. I was sick, and you tended to my needs. I was in prison, and you comforted me. 
Even then, the righteous will not have achieved perfect understanding and will not recall these things. Master, when did we find you hungry and give you food? When did we find you thirsty and slake your thirst? When did we find you a stranger and welcome you in or find you naked and clothe you? When did we find you sick and nurse you to health? When did we visit you when you were in prison? I tell you this, whenever you saw a brother or sister hungry or cold, whatever you did to the least of these, you did to me. At that, he will turn to those on his left hand. Get away from me, you despised people whom my father has cursed. Claim your inheritance, the pits of flaming hell where the devil and his minions suffer. For I was starving, and you left me with no food. When I was dry and thirsty, you left me to struggle with nothing to drink. When I was alone as a stranger, you turned away from me. When I was pitifully naked, you left me unclothed. When I was sick, you gave me no care. When I was in prison, you did not comfort me. Master, when did we see you hungry and thirsty? When did we see you friendless or homeless or excluded? When did we see you without clothes? When did we see you sick or in jail? When did we see you in distress and fail to respond? I tell you this, whenever you saw a brother hungry or cold, when you saw a sister weak and without friends, when you saw the least of these and ignored their suffering, so you ignored me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable unto you, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. From the very beginning of our faith, from the very beginning of our knowledge of what it means to be Christian, we hear stories of chaos. The creation was breathed and birthed out of the chaos of nothingness. From the very beginning, we have this polarization of what is good and what isn't, what is evil and what isn't. And from the very beginning, we really wanted to know how it was all going to end. And so a kind of biblical literature called apocalyptic literature developed. In the Bible, as I said earlier, an apocalypse is when God pulls back the curtain to show someone what's really going on in the world from a divine perspective. So throughout the Bible, we have these glimpses of apocalyptic literature, not literature that is like fortune telling, telling us what the future is but literature that reminds us of what it is that God sees and how we are to respond. Take Isaiah the prophet. In the sixth chapter, he's suddenly transported in a vision into God's throne room. He is in God's temple, which is described as a bridge between heaven and earth. And this was so that Isaiah could be challenged to bring comfort and challenge to God's people, not in some far distant future, but in his own time. Or there's the Apostle Paul, who was trying to stop the movement of Jesus. This is before he was Paul, he was stopped in his tracks by a vision of the risen Christ himself. 
and he realized that he was fighting against the very thing that he had been hoping for. He had been hoping for the Messiah. He had been hoping for the Savior. He had not been able to see that in the stories of Jesus. But when he is confronted by a vision of the risen Christ, it changed the course of his life. So, apocalypses give people a heavenly perspective on what it is we're going through. They can give hope, or they can give challenge. Or they can make us change everything that we think we know about. Apocalyptic imagery is based on biblical design patterns that began in the book of Genesis and then developed through the Bible. The chaotic sea in the first sentences of the Bible that God tames but doesn't get rid of as God orders creation. The sea becomes an image of danger, death, and cosmic chaos. And then there are, there's the land, beasts that we are supposed to take care of, to steward, and yet we are deceived by a beast and we start acting like violent beasts. In the book of Daniel, we'll, we are told that these beasts symbolize violent human kingdoms. But more often, the authors of the Bible assume we know how to trace an image the biblical story to understand its meaning because the Bible was given to people who were supposed to understand the Bible. Sometimes we don't get those symbols and so we try to order them and think about them in terms of how we are as opposed to terms of how God is. It's a lot to understand, and it's difficult. But the purpose of apocalyptic literature is very clear, to give us a heavenly perspective on our earthly circumstances so that every generation of God's people can be challenged, comforted, and given hope for the future. Today, the word we are focusing on is witness. When I was in college, I was involved with a group that took witnessing very seriously. But witnessing went something like this. If you die today, do you know where you're going tomorrow? You know, that's a great way to make friends and influence people, isn't it? Are you dead yet? Or, I'm sure you've all seen the one. Don't let the ones carrying your casket into the church. Don't let that be the first time you go to church. It's much more eloquent than that. But you get it. We try to scare people into faith. As a matter of fact, I had a parishioner one time who said to me, I wish I really believed in all that fear stuff because it's a good motivator. I don't know about you. I don't want to be motivated by fear. Because when you're motivated by fear, it causes you to act fearfully. My friend Iptasam is from Jordan. She's Muslim, always wears her hajib, and I haven't seen her in years. One of the most delightful women I know, and happily walked around the Muncie community and the Ball State community sharing her joy until the day after 9-11 when people who had accepted her one day 
saw her hasheed and did not accept her the next. Her parents had been with us that weekend and we'd had a wonderful meal. And her mother also wore her hasheed. But they left to go back to Jordan early morning, September 11th. And they were landed in an airport. And it didn't take long for her mother to remove the hasheed in public because she was frightened. Fear causes us to act fearfully and to share that fear with others, to respond to the fear rather than to respond to the love of God. I know I've shared this one with you before, and I'll share it again because it's so powerful. I've been blessed in my neighborhoods where I've lived to have youth like Reef and Oscar who could go in to my house and take care of my dogs if I needed that to happen. And sometimes as they got older, they would even spend the night in my house to be dog sitters. I had this delightful friend who had a son named Joe. And after her two daughters became old enough that they had gone off on into college, Joe became my dog sitter. When I first met Joe, he was a scrawny punk kid. A couple of years of football, and he was no longer a scrawny punk kid. He was a, a big kid with a heart of gold. And he would come to my house, and he would walk Winston and Molasses, the old English sheepdog and the basset hound, and he would hang out with them for a while. He had a key. I was talking to my neighbor one day and said, by the way, I'm going to be gone for the next couple of days. I've asked, you know, if you see a young man going into the house, it's okay, he has my permission. Is he that black kid? Only he didn't use that word. Yeah. Well, it's a good thing you told me or I would have pulled a gun out and shot him. Fear causes us to do terrible things. And somehow we have got this idea that if we use fear to share the love of Jesus, it's going to make a difference in the world. What would happen? if we would use love to share the love of Jesus? To take away all of that fear-based language? Yes, there's fear in what we read from Matthew 25, because it's apocalyptic literature, and the writer assumed that we would pull it back and not be literal with it, but that we would look at the imagery, and the imagery says... When you treat people like you're treating me, when you're good to people, you're following me. Doesn't mean that everything will always be okay. Look how people treated Jesus and where it landed him. But we're called to focus not on those last few hours of Jesus' death, we're called to focus on the multiple of hours of his life and to look at how he treated other people and to do the same. That's what it means to witness. What it means to witness is to get out of our fear, to make sure that the world is a good place for others. What it means to witness is to live our lives knowing that the way Jesus calls us to live is the way of grace and the way of love and the way of hope and the way of challenge and a way that changes structures that 
try to separate people based on fear and not on love. The past several weeks, we've talked about all the different aspects of what it means to follow Jesus, not only as United Methodists, but as believers. To pray, to be present, not only with God, but with our neighbor. To use our gifts, to use our hands, our feet, our minds, our service. And to share the good news of Jesus Christ with the world. Not out of fear, but out of hope. We have one life to live. May we live it as witnesses of Jesus Christ. This time of stewardship sharing is more than a time of announcements. It is about how we live and how we use the gifts we have been given, our time, presence, prayers, talents, money, to witness to the power of Christ with us. 
Emmanuel, God with us. Please take the printed announcements home with you and pray for those who are touched by our ministry during the week. Stewardship is truly action, action giving and prayer, always prayer. And by the way, remember, we don't always tell you everything, so you do have to read the bulletins. Madrigal practices have almost begun. Come enjoy this amazing group of musicians on Wednesdays at 7.30 p.m. and Sundays at 2 o'clock p.m. Beginning next Sunday and next Wednesday. Yeah, this coming Wednesday and next Sunday. A celebration of life for Marge Luther will take place here at the church next Saturday, November 4th at 11 o'clock a.m. Um, All Those Saints Sunday is next Sunday, November 5th. If you would like for the name of a loved one lost this year to be included, please contact the church office no later than Tuesday, November 2nd. Also, um, we are changing the way that we are distributing the crossbeams. So you should have received an email that you can download, and then we will have copies here for you to pick up. And then um, if any of you are willing to deliver crossbeams to some of our homebound members, that will also give them the opportunity to see some of us face to face. As Joe comes around with a microphone, please share your joys and concerns with the congregation, making sure that you speak directly into the mic so that your prayer requests might be heard. Those of you who are worshiping with us on Facebook Live, please continue sharing in the chat. Those of you who later in the week will be watching on a Access Cable TV, you may contact us through the church office or on email or on Facebook with your prayer requests. The very act of sharing these requests and celebrations becomes our prayer. Anyone? Yes, thank you for your prayers. Let us pray. Oh God, it seems as if every time we open the newspaper or click the link on our devices, we discover that another young person in our county has died. We pray for those losses, for the friends who grieve, for the families who are in shock. May we never become immune to the power of those losses. We especially pray for Joe's friend, his family, and the Galveston community as they grieve his loss. We pray for our church, O oh God, that just as you led your people through apocalyptic literature from the very beginning, you continue to lead us now. May we pull away the curtains of our expectations to see what it is you have for us, following you with joy, with hope, with comfort, and allowing ourselves to be challenged. We pray for our denomination as we continue to move toward our next general conference. Oh God, soon our bishop will retire and we will receive a new one. And so we begin our prayers now 
that the right bishop will be sent to us to calmly and firmly lead us into the future that you call us toward. We pray for our communities, for our world. We pray for the land that so many call holy, that shalom will rule and hatred and fear will drift away. Violence and murder never brings the answers that we need to live in peace. This we pray in the name of your Son who teaches us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. As, as we begin to move into the next part of our service, we're going to change things up a little bit, because why not? You know, God calls us to do things differently, but in this case, we're going back to something old. After the offering has been collected, the ushers will bring the offering back up front. We will leave it on the communion table, and we will pray over it. So... We got to get it done, and then during the doxology, they will bring the offering forward. So, will the ushers please come to receive our offering? Holy One, receive these gifts. They come from our hearts. Receive the gifts of our time, our talents, our gifts, our presence, our prayers, our witness. May they be used so that others may know the powerful witness of your love. Amen. <clears throat> if you would remain standing in body or spirit for our closing hymn, it can be found on page 302 in your hymnals. Christ the Lord is risen today. 302.
As you leave today, please splash in the water found in the baptismal bowl at the bank, back of the sanctuary. That means that some of you sitting in the back might have to come forward a little bit. Please feel free to take one of the shells. 
And as you look at it and touch it and see it during the week and month and years to come, remember to honor God with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness. And now, may the grace of God lead you forth, filled with love, to do all the good you can, in all the times you can, in all the places you can, where'er you can. Amen. Thank you.